Kiora, and welcome to Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Let me be your guide as we take a walk into the shadowy realms of the unexplained, of the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts. I'm Mary Ann. Thanks so much for joining us today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. Sit back, relax, and let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and see what awaits us there. What's the very first thing that most people think of when they hear the words a Ouija board? Most, but obviously not all people, think of horror movies like the Ouija board scene in The Exorcist or any one of other countless horror movie genres that have used the Ouija board as basis for a storyline. Or they automatically think of horror stories they may have heard from people who have used the board or they may believe whatever religious teachings they have learnt about the use of such devices, then again, some simply consider them nothing more than a toy or a parlour game. But are Ouija boards a toy? Really, are they? The subject of Ouija boards, otherwise known as talking boards, spirit boards, communication boards, clear channel boards, charmed spirit boards, and this name that I have difficulty pronouncing, so forgive my mispronunciation, Walpursnack which boards, amongst others, has come up again and again. I seriously thought about doing this episode for some weeks now. So, are you ready to walk with me into this part of the Shadowlands and see what awaits us there? Let's begin. What is an Ouija board? Firstly though, I feel it's important to give at least a very condensed history on what they are. Likely there are very few who have not heard of an Ouija board or who do not know what they are, thanks in large part to all the TV movies, notably The Exorcist mentioned before, amongst others. But for those who perhaps have not, here's a physical description of an Ouija board. An Ouija board is a flat board with the letters of the alphabet arrayed in two semicircles above the numbers 0 through 9. The words yes and no in the uppermost corners. Goodbye at the bottom accompanied by a planchette, which is generally these days a tear-shaped device. Usually it has a small window in the body. The planchette is used to manoeuvre about the board. The idea was that two or more people would sit around the board place their fingertips on the planchette, pose a question and watch as the planchette moved from letter to letter, supposedly moved by a spirit spelling out the answers. Boards and planchettes used to be made out of solid wood. Now they are cardboard and plastic for the most part. However, when I was a young and stupid kid, we created talking glasses which were simply letters of the alphabet and numbers 0 to 10 written on pieces of paper and placed in a circle on a flat surface, generally a tabletop. A simple kitchen glass was used as the planchette. Other than that, it functioned in exactly the same way as an Ouija board did. So how did Ouija boards come into popular use? Well, in 1848, two sisters, Margaret and Kate Fox, who lived in upstate New York, claimed to have received messages from spirits who knocked on their walls in answer to questions. This eventually reached the media who spread it throughout the country and spiritualism was born. Millions across America and the world turned to spiritualism as the answer for connecting with loved ones that had passed. We have to realise that this was an era when very few people lived past the age of 50 years old due to the living conditions and standards, health care, etc. in that era. The average lifespan in that era was less than 50 years old. Women died giving birth, children died from diseases, men died in wars. 
During the American Civil War, spiritualism gained millions of people who were desperate to connect with their loved ones that had gone to war and had never returned. It was a time when people seemed to be ready and wanting the comfort of belief in a continued existence. Spiritualist communities and groups were established worldwide and mediums, a very large percentage of them, who were fake and were merely capitalising on the current trend, began to hold seances. Table tipping and other means of communication with the dead were at best cumbersome and noisy, and in order to be able to communicate with loved ones who had passed, people had to rely on seances led by these dubious people. Mostly fake mediums, simply out to fleece money from desperate people. People who were grieving for their loved ones and simply wanted to know that they still existed and were okay. So what forms of communication did they use initially? There was table tipping or table wrapping. This was a form of seance where people sat around a table. They would place their hands on it and wait for it to tip, tilt or otherwise move in response to questions to spirit. There's a very old picture on this episode's page on the podcast website www.walkingtheshadowlands.com of a table tipping session. Other forms of attempting communication were tried. One of these was spirit writing or psychography. Today it would be called automatic writing. This was done initially by holding a pencil in an upside down basket or planchette and the idea was that the spirit took control of your hand and wrote things automatically. After a while, someone invented the talking board. Its original origins are shrouded in mystery. However, in 1891, a person by the name of Elijah J. Bond submitted a patent for the first official talking board, calling it a toy or a game. A copy of that patent can also be seen on the website. The term talking board that Elijah gave to his patent is generally used these days as more of a generic term for any message board that has numbers, letters and a movable message indicator, whether that's a planchette or an upside down glass, although in this case, as previously mentioned, it's called Ask the Glass. This movable object is lightly touched by one or more persons and will slide or pivot along the surface of the board to spell out words or messages. The Ouija board got its name from the sister-in-law of the board's inventor, Helen Peters. Helen was supposedly a very strong medium, and she asked the board what it wished to be named. It spelled out Ouija in result. When they asked what that meant, supposedly the board responded with the words, good luck. Some would argue that an Ouija board is just another divination device like divining rods, table tipping, automatic writing, etc., Also, there are other boards that use pendulums, fixed spinners or rolling boards. These latter are not technically regarded as talking boards, although the effect is definitely the same. And these days you could also add to that list ghost boxes. There's a great debate about whether the messages given on these boards indeed come from supernatural entities or are they solely a psychological physiological phenomena, one that is created by the users of the board. According to some scientific sources, there are two factors that come into play when using an Ouija board. There's a strong, generally subconscious need for an answer to any specific question the user has. There is a phenomenon called the idiomotor effect. So what is the idiomotor effect? Wikipedia has this to say about the idiomotor effect. As in reflexive responses to pain, the body sometimes reacts reflectively with an idiomotor effect to ideas alone without the person consciously deciding to take the action. The effects of automatic writing, dowsing, facilitated communication and Ouija boards have been attributed to the phenomena. So therefore, the idiomotor effect says that people can move or move something without their conscious mind realising it. In the case of the Ouija board, if you really want the answer to a question to be yes, and any other person also on the board with you knows it, they could all push the planchette to yes without anyone consciously applying any force. 
Certainly, I do not disagree in the least that probably a large percentage of talking board communication can be put down to this effect. On this episode's page on the podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com, there's a link to a YouTube video that explains this effect very clearly. Whilst I personally agree with most of what they're saying, I do not agree that all Ouija experiences can be explained away by this. Here is where science and my personal experiences diverge greatly. When I was in my very early teens, in the late 60s, we did the talking glass thing at our kitchen table. The glass would not move unless I was present in the room, even if I was not actually on the board itself. When I was in the room, it would talk. We contacted what appeared to be a young lad our age. He told us his name, that he lived in Japan and had died from smallpox. He even gave us the year of his death. Although, of course, there was no internet then, so checking any of this out for validity was nigh on impossible. A group of us had contact with this kid for a number of weeks, and I felt a real kinship with him, and he deliberately targeted me. Looking back, I can see why. I was a very young, vulnerable, and developing medium. So this entity totally played on my sympathies and my vulnerability telling me often how lonely he was where he was, although I was not aware of this until after the fact, and a few years later when I was more experienced. Anyway, one day a group of us were chatting as normal with this kid, when he tells me that I should commit suicide so that we could be together as friends forever and he would no longer be lonely. I felt so sorry for him because he was lonely. As he finished saying this, my mum walked into the room. She heard what he had just said and she went to reach for the glass to take it off us. It flew out of our hands and smashed against the wall on the other side of the table. Just shot out of our hands. That was the end of my experimenting with a talking glass Ouija board. It took weeks, weeks before our house felt clean again and we were no longer freaked out. Fast forward to 2017. My paranormal investigation team and I were approached to check out a home of two of the team members that were experiencing supposed paranormal activity. This included cold spots, objects moving, disembodied voices, shadow figures, apparitions of a child and others, and physical touching, including intimately, foul smells amongst other things. So we did an initial interview with the clients and had a tour of the house. The female of the house, I will call her Sophia, was the one experiencing most of the paranormal activity, but her partner also was very aware of events that were happening in the home and had seen some of them for himself. The house was in a cul-de-sac-shaped street and was, as all of them at that end of the street, a two-storey duplex unit with each house joined by a sheer wall. On our initial visit, we were very aware of cold spots in the house in 30 degrees Celsius summer heat and of spots in the house that literally caused the hairs on our arms to raise, along with a sense of being unwelcome and downright hostility in some of the places. Only in certain spots of the property though and not all over. Also, a door slammed by itself with no breeze in the house. It was a very still, quiet summer day. As is our norm, we took a digital recorder and recorded our interview with the client. On this, we captured some very clear EVP, or electronic voice phenomena. This is when voices which are not heard audibly are captured on digital recorders. In some of these EVP, we captured voices that were very negative towards Sophia. We asked when the activity started and what they felt caused it to begin. Sophia mentioned in a Ouija board that she said belonged to her ex-flatmate who had only recently moved out of their home. She commented that she felt this flatmate had used the board and performed some sort of ceremony over the board and this all started from there. We asked Sophia if she had ever participated in the use of this board which she categorically denied and said that in fact she would never ever touch one. 
At the same time, she is saying that we get an EVP calling her a liar, along with deep growls and guttural sounds. Obviously, we didn't hear this audibly, and it wasn't until we were back home going over the interview tape and subjective and objective experiences that we heard the recording. We organised an investigation for the home which Sophia cancelled on us the night beforehand. Not a problem, these things happen. Meantime, those of us who initially visited the home started having different things happening in our own homes. Things like disembodied growls, guttural noises, bangs, scratching our windows and doors, foul smells. At the beginning, none of us mentioned this to the others, but we all experienced one or some of them. We soon dealt with the entities once we realised the source of them and what was actually happening. We subsequently found out that Sophia was still actively using the board. Her partner was unaware of this actually. She was deliberately inviting entities into her home. Now, we can't do anything for people who actually want and invite these phenomena into their lives. That is entirely their choice. Sophia was enjoying having the attention these entities in her home brought her. We withdrew from the case after sitting them both down together and being frank and honest with them. The husband was actually gutted about all of this, but we cannot help people who invite this activity in and want it. And I also removed them from the investigation group. In Sophia using the board, she deliberately and knowingly invited entities into her home and allowed one of them to attach to her. Now, these entities are very low-life entities and the type that enjoy creating fear and discord and attaching to people where they can feed off their energies. This was definitely not a case of idiomotor effect. This was, and still is, spiritual parasites. Now, three years later, and I'm prepping for this episode, I asked the members of my Walk in the Shadowlands Facebook group, big shout out to you all who are listening, if any of them had any experiences with an Ouija board that they might like to share with everyone in this episode. And this particular member who lived in the next small town over from me messaged me to say that she had experienced so much activity in her home that it caused them to flee the property because of her neighbours using an Ouija board, also that I actually knew the place she was referring to. That was when I realised she was referring to Sophia's place. I'm keeping her anonymous, but these are the words she shared with me. When we first moved into our house, we found out very quickly of the little spirit girl that floated between the houses as she played happily with our daughter. Nothing else was out of the ordinary. Friends of ours moved next door a year later and from the get-go, weird stuff started happening. Once their border moved in, all hell broke loose, so to speak. Paranormal activity amped up in a big way, from the sweet little spirit girl who played so nicely with our two-year-old, turning quite mean and nasty, to shadows and black mist-type sightings through our journey bathroom wall. These houses were all connected. My daughter would go to the neighbour's house and return home screaming about the mean man at the top of the stairs, or the yucky man with the horns that followed her. We asked constantly what they were doing to cause these sightings and found out they had an Ouija board. The boarder used it for dark reasons, but none of them knew how to close it off. For months, our home was filled with a presence that turned us all into angry, violent people. We were pushed downstairs, things moved, dolls and toys possessed. Our daughter became a shell of her normal, happy self. I confronted the neighbours. Our friends pleaded with them to stop. They were provoking the spirits that had always been there, bringing new ones in through the board, and we were suffering. The last straw came for us when a dear friend came over and told us we weren't safe anymore. He went next door and told them what they were doing was going to hurt people. They claimed they would stop, but as he was leaving, he looked upstairs and didn't like what he saw. We were driven out from our home. We moved in with relatives. I always thought the boards were harmless. How wrong I was. Anon and I talked a little bit more about her experiences here. I asked her what it was her friend saw at the top of the stairs. She said, A dark shadow of a man with a menacing look 
and he, their friend, got the vibe that of they are mine, you will not win. That's where our friend found him when my daughter refused to go upstairs one night. Our friend got woken up and felt he needed to come to our house. When he got there, my daughter was hysterical. We went through hell. The only reprieve was actually when your group were around. It settled for a little bit around that time, but it amped up as soon as Sophia was kicked out of the group. I then asked Anon about the little girl spirit that we had picked up on our initial investigation and she said, Some research we did with a lady who'd lived on the street for years said the little girl had been seen in nearly every house and there were stories of a little girl that died falling down the stairs. She didn't like adults but was drawn to kids. We then had a small conversation about how the wee girl spirit was later being impersonated by the entities to gain their daughter's trust as until events started amping up in Sophia's home, the little girl had been loving and playful but definitely not evil, mean or malicious at all. And she concluded with, The one spirit that worried us the most was the devil-like man. He followed the car to my friend's house. We went there because my daughter would not settle until she saw him. Sophia was with us and tried to tell him she knew what was happening. He told her to shut up, and she was the problem, not the solution. Soon after that we moved. I doubt if Sophia's house has been cleansed. The street has gone to ruin, and they can't keep tenants in that one particular house. This is Raquel. She and I had a very long conversation, almost an hour actually, so I'm not including all of it in here, and I will summarise parts of the conversation in places. My name is Raquel. I'm from New York. My mother can, you know, can talk to spirits, see spirits, so this is where I got my interest from. One day I decided I'd like a Ouija board. Uh, We went to Toys R Us at the time. I think I was about 15 years old. I went to Toys R Us and I bought a glow in the dark Ouija board. Um, I thought at the time it was just going to be fun. It wasn't even going to work, you know, and my mother told me, you know, you got to be careful with this. I really don't want you playing with it. I'm going to buy it for you. Hopefully it doesn't work and it'll get you to just, you know, get that that interest out of you just so you can do it and then after that hopefully nothing happens when I played the game I tried to play it at first by myself and it never worked until one day I was in school a couple years had passed actually and the the board never worked a couple years had passed and I was in high school and I said I was with my friend and we decided to skip school and stay in my house and I said "Let's, let's pull out the Ouija board let's play when we played, the board was actually active for the first time. And I asked, who am I speaking to? And it spelled out Lewis, L-U-I-S. I asked Lewis, you know, how old are you? He put 13. But then when he put 13, he went, he put the planchette at the middle of the board. And then he went back down and put the word, the number seven. When I asked, I said, seven, what does seven mean? He said, it's been seven years. So seven years till you, since you passed? He said, yes. But in form, in his form, he said he was as a 20-year-old. He looked like a 20-year-old. At the time, I'm like, okay, um, how did you find me? Like, how are you here? He said, you woke me up. I was lost. I was lost and you, like, I found you. I heard your voice. I kept asking, um, is anyone here? Is anyone here? And that's where he said that, I'm, that he, you know, he heard my voice and I had woke him, I guess. Time had passed and I started talking to Louis more daily and I started to feel comfortable with him. Every time I went to the board, it was always Louis. Um, it became to a point when I played, when I pulled out the board, I didn't even have to ask. I just take out the board and I say, hey, Louis, how you doing? And we'll, we'll talk. And it became more of an addiction. Every day I was talking to Lewis until one day Lewis told me that he was sad that his mother had stopped visiting his grave. He told me he was from the Dominican Republic and he, was, he died in a car crash. He was the passenger and his father 
was the driver, but his father was the one that stayed alive and he died. He told me that he was so sad that his mother was not visiting his grave if I could call his mother and tell her to visit him. And at the time I thought, how am I going to call this woman and tell her that her, that I'm speaking to her dead son and he's, Mm -hmm. you know, a uh, upset that he that the mother hasn't visited him in weeks and it was as if she was sad as if she kind of gave up on him she she was so miserable she didn't want to go to the grave anymore i actually ended up calling her and the mother stayed shut on the phone she stayed quiet and hung up on me i didn't want to call again because i felt like that was the confirmation that i needed i said what i said on the phone i said hi my name is whatever it was in spanish i spoke this speak in spanish i am bilingual I spoke to her and I said, you know, I know your son. I spoke to your son and he's upset. I don't know if this is the right person. He gave me your phone number. He gave me a phone number to another country. Actually bought a phone card and called his mother. And she stayed on the phone. She stayed quiet as if she had to soak everything in. Maybe even like, I'm not sure. She just stayed quiet and hung up. And I never bothered her again. Time had passed. I talked to Lewis. And then one day I, I spoke, I had went to the, to Rite Aid and I had like a corn on my toe, like from wearing tight shoes. And I was so embarrassed to go to the, at Rite Aid at, at a store. I was so embarrassed to buy these corn bandages for your toes. I was so embarrassed to buy it at the cashier. Um, I made somebody else buy it for me. And when I went, I went home and I told the board and I said, I said, Hey, Louis, how are you doing? He said, it was funny today that you didn't want to, he wrote, it's funny that you didn't want to buy the bandages. And right there, I said, what do you mean? He said, I was there. He said, I laughed. He said, I laughed when you didn't buy the bandages and took me back. And that's when I thought, how is he not, how is he not in the board? Like, how is he following me now? So I kept that in and I pretended to laugh. I was like, yeah, that was funny. That was so funny. But I kept in my mind, like, you know, Lewis is not in, you know, in the board anymore. Lewis is now following me. I remember saying, I'm happy to tell my mother. I have to tell my mother. Now this is scary. So I'm coming home from, I'm coming home from work and I'm with my mother. And I told my mother, mommy, I need to talk to you about something. And she said, you're playing the Ouija board. And you let out a spirit, didn't you? And I looked at her and I said, how do you know? She said, there's been a man standing by the door of my apartment. I live in an apartment. She said, there's, an, um, there's a man standing by the apartment door for the past week. He doesn't do anything. He just stands there. And I immediately started, you know, confessing, mom, like, let me tell you what's been going on. Like I started telling her like everything that's been going on and that I haven't told her because she always told me she didn't want me to play it. So because I'm, I'm finally like, wow, she understands. She's seeing it. Like, this is not just me. You know, like when I play with my friends, they always thought I was the one pl- moving a planchette or something, you know, um, that there must be a science behind it, that we're all just unconscious, consciously moving it. But the, my mom gave me the confirmation that she was like, you know, this, this guy has been sitting there. So I, she brought me to the room and I was actually in tears because I was so scared. I'm like, wow, I actually brought a spirit out. This is real. She tells me this is how, how high he is. He's dark, dark skin. He's a teen. He looks like a teenager, a young, a young man. And he's actually standing right next to you. She's like, she, the way that he sees you is more as a little sister. He's standing by the door. He's telling me that he's standing by the door because he's protecting the house. He's more of like securing the house, like he's security. He has to stand by the door to protect us. After all of this happened, she's telling me what he looks like. She's telling me, I told her the story about what he told me. She said, yes, that I, he's telling me the same story. She actually gave me more details about what happened that night that the kid, that Lewis at the time, that when he was 13, when it happened, what happened. When I would sleep, my door, I, I slept in my living room. We only had a one bedroom. My mother had the, living, the, the bedroom and we'd sleep. Me and my sister would sleep in the living room. And in the living room, there was a hall. And down the hall is where the front door is, where Lewis would be standing. And 
every night we would see a silhouette of a man. And it got to the point that I didn't even care anymore. I actually felt safe seeing the spirit. One day we decided to go to Florida and I decided, let me take my board with me. I couldn't, I couldn't not take it. One night I was with my cousin and she never played the board. It seems as if my cousin had this bolt of energy of, of so much like energy in her hands that as soon as she moved, she put her hand on the planchette. Lewis was, was able to, to talk so much faster that we had, to, we had a harder time keeping up with what he was saying. And one night, it was maybe 12 o'clock at night, and it's me, my sister, and my cousin. She got a call. While we're playing, she got a call. And her boyfriend had fell down the stairs. And when her boyfriend had, my mother was like, oh, this is so weird. He fell down the stairs. He's in the hospital. And I remember as we're playing the game, she asked the board, was that you? And he said, yes, that was me. And she said, why would you do that? And he said, because he hit you. And she's like, how do you know that? I didn't even know that. I didn't even know she was getting abused. And he said, he hits you. And she was like, why would you, but why would you push him down the stairs? He's in the hospital. And behind us, the door, my back was against the door. We're sitting on the floor, um, Indian style. My back is behind the door and he kicks the door. I hear a, 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 and we all jolted and we're like, what's going on? And I said, is that you? And he said, yes, that's me. I'm upset right now. And I said, I, why would you do that? I can't believe that he actually did the door. Like, this is my door. That's what it sounded like. It was very hard. And because my back was against it, I was so scared. And I opened my door. There was nobody there. The thud woke up my father that Lewis said, your father is coming. And he himself put goodbye. He swiped it goodbye. And no more than maybe 30 seconds, my dad opened the door and I slid the Ouija board under my bed. From this point, Raquel began to have mixed feelings about her conversations with Lewis. She was scared, and she continues. Lewis can actually touch things now. We went from not playing in the board, now he's following us. He came with us to Florida. He knew what my house looked like. He came with us everywhere. It was, it was, it was really scary. Rachel realized he could manipulate physical objects, but she was still obsessed with him and started skipping classes in high school nearly every day and spent days talking with him, hosting what she called Ouija board parties in her home. She was at this stage about 18 years old. She was totally obsessed and justified her actions by saying that it was really to prove to herself that this was real. But at the same time, there was some fear there, and his manipulation of Raquel and control began to show. She says of how it was then. Lewis knows everything. Like, Lewis knows things that's going on that well, we, he'll be talking to us here, but he can tell me what someone is doing in their house. Lewis would be so, like, jealous. He wouldn't want anybody else to come through. He'd say, no, like, I only I can come through. Only I can speak with you guys. That it got to the point where he would just do all the time. And a lot of people, like our boyfriends or people who did stuff to us in school, who were bullies or anybody who did me, you know, were just rude to me throughout the day, Lewis would say he would handle them. He would tell me, if anybody did anything to you, I will hurt them. And at the time, I thought that was so cool. At the time, I thought, wow, I have a spirit that I, that not, like, I can man- manipulate. I can, I can ask him to do favors for me. This, this person is willing to protect me. This person is willing to do things for me. This person talks to me like a normal person. He'll talk to me about people that I spoke to. Hey, that person is not good for you. I don't like that person for you. This person is not good for you. I think after that, I had put into my mind that this is, and it wasn't fun anymore because a lot of people who I didn't want them to get hurt, you know, I didn't want things to happen to these guys. Like I, you know, I was dating and if they'd hurt me, 
you know, just bad things would happen. A lot of bad luck would happen. And I would ask Louis, like, are you responsible for that? And nonchalantly, he'd say yes. And that's when I said, you know, this is not fun anymore because I didn't, you know, he didn't, ex- he didn't, he didn't uh, deserve that. You know, there were some people I just don't want to punish. I understand they did me wrong, but I don't need to punish every single one, Louis. I don't need to do that. And well, eventually, I stopped playing the game. I stopped playing the Ouija board. And I'm 27 now. I'm getting dangerous. Can't say nothing about him. Don't say nothing bad about him because people hear it. You know, don't say nothing bad about me. If you got problems with me, please don't have no problems with me because you don't want to deal with noise. That's how it was. Controlling. It was very controlling. Definitely, I see how, how, how so into it I was. And I didn't care about the information with Lewis anymore. It was more about I'm growing up. You know, it opened up my mind to the spiritual world and what spirits can do. And the things that can't come from a Ouija board, you know, I always thought that I was in control. I put the candles, I did the sage, um, I did everything. I did, I did everything. I went online. I did looked up the Ouija do's and don'ts. I did everything, all the research you can do on Google. But it, it doesn't matter because it doesn't prepare you for who you're going to come in contact with when you actually do it. And I thought the candle, the white candles, was going to protect me. I thought the sage was going to protect me and maybe they do, maybe they do protect you, but I didn't put the intention that I was supposed to, to, um, to, to protect me. I didn't put that white light around me. I didn't do any of that. I just thought at the time, you know, it says put white candles and I did it, but I didn't put that intent, that meditation and, and pray and say, you know, you know, this, this, you know, say what I wanted. I didn't do that. Now I'm grown and I'm like, oh my God. Raquel still has mixed feelings about her relationship with Lewis. A part of her recognizes that she was being controlled and in part manipulated by him, while part of her still sees him as a friend.
birthday wish from Karina. A small group of six of us got together for our friend's 15th birthday at his house. We decided we'd try create an Ouija board, writing it all on a piece of paper and using a 50 cent coin as our mover. Some were too scared and watched, so four of us partook. We didn't know what we were doing. One friend spoke up and said, are there any spirits present? Nothing happened for the first minute, but eventually the coin slowly moved. We initially started blaming each other for moving the coin or started to think it was nerves moving it subconsciously. After persevering as it started to speed up, we realised it was spelling words between gibberish. We took a break because we were all a bit baffled and frightened. After a while, we couldn't stop thinking about it and had another go. It would say hello and we'd ask their message and it would say happy birthday. Wow, that was cool, we thought. We then asked who it was. The reply was Dad. Our birthday friend needed time out, so we exited. Some of us knew his dad took his own life about 10 years prior, and we felt sad for him. Once again, we had another go. This time we got an innocent but very scared five-year-old boy. We felt sorry for him and tried to piece together the sad life he once lived. He had a bubbly, loving mother but horrible, abusive father. He wouldn't disclose how he died and was getting more distraught with every question we asked. Eventually he told us he needed us to do something. Our anxiety level started to rise, but we had trusted this poor, sad little boy. What is it you want us to do? A friend asked, thinking it would be harmless. The board spelt these words continuously over and over until we exited the board. Satisfy my request. Satisfy my request. By then, we knew we certainly had tapped into something sinister and that it wasn't one of us playing around. We took a half an hour breather, but were still intrigued, so jumped back on the board. This time we got a 90-year-old lady. We were very alert that something might be playing around with us pretending to be a child or elderly. This one was short as we asked her name. Her response, 666. We exited immediately and destroyed the handwritten paper board, vowing that we had come across something evil. We didn't sleep much that night, talking about happy things to distract us. Luckily, nothing further came from our experience, but looking back, it was such a bad idea, and one that certainly taught us a lesson. The Shadow Under the Door from Christina I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago and thought about posting my experience. Not a super traumatic one, but freaky at that. I was living with a friend of mine at her parents' house when I was, I think, 15 or 16 years old. I'm 34 now. So it was me, her and another friend, but I can't remember who right now. It was daytime and we decided to have a go at making our own Ouija board. I think it was with a mirror, so obviously we decided to give it a test go. I don't remember what we asked, probably something like, are there any spirits here with us? My friend's dog was in the room with us and suddenly jolted up and looked at the bedroom door and ran up to it and started frantically barking at it. We saw a shadow at the bottom of the door, but no one opened it to come in. It just stayed there while the dog kept barking. Our hearts were pounding. The dog eventually stopped barking and we opened the door to see clearly no one was there. We were so freaked out. To this day, I think about this occasion often. Finally, this next experience shows that you don't even actually have to use a board yourself to cause issues in your life, as with the experience shared earlier in this episode. This was one that a friend of mine had. Nick messaged me pretty much immediately he had the first experience in his home and I saw the whole event unfold and saw the aftermath of it all. Uh, My name is Nick. I live in uh, Michigan, which is in the United States. I'm friends with Marianne, but uh, (laughs) I... uh, wanted to give my experiences with the Ouija board. I've had quite a few. I don't mess with it anymore. Probably the earliest I started playing with the Ouija board is probably my late teens, early 20s. It was right when I met my gr- or well, my wife now. We went over to a friend's house and would go play with it over there. 
uh, one of the main, I guess, big events that, you know, I knew that it's not anything to mess around with is uh, one time we we're, you know, playing with it and uh, we didn't have the pie shot. We couldn't find it. So we had the candle lit that was next to the board. And uh, on the top, it was a glass candle. So it had like that rubber ring around it. And we took that off to use it as the pie shot. And uh, within maybe a few minutes of using it, all of a sudden we looked down and there's blood forming on the other side of the uh, ring. And, uh, you know, it wasn't there. And we seen it with our own eyes appearing. And then from one corner of the room to around the whole room, it went completely black. And, like, the candle was lit, and the flame shot up. It was just a normal flame. And then it was probably a good maybe two feet tall. It was, you know, it was huge. Wow. And uh, it wasn't even, like, the flame was off the wick. And so that was weird. But the one thing is, like, the whole room was blacked out, and there's no reflection of light anywhere. Like, the just the light from the candle was just in that spot where the candle was. And then uh, after that, um, How did that make you at the time, time I was, well, I, at the time I kind of, I wasn't afraid, but it was more so, like, interesting. Because I've never seen that happen before out of the other times that we used it. And uh, what happened, too, is we've had this one spirit that every time we use it, he comes up and he, you know, torments us. And we knew that's uh, who was coming when the room blacked out like that. And uh, he started talking to us through the board. And then uh, our friend, she was sitting on the bed. And it was just me and my, well, girlfriend at the time, but now wife, were using the board. And all of a sudden, she started choking. And uh, she was like, she couldn't breathe. And uh, we looked over, and on her throat, there was fingerprints. And it was to the point where her face was, you know, turning blue. And so finally, we're like, okay, you know, stop it. Leave her alone. And then finally, you know, whatever it was, let go of her and she could breathe again and then from after that you know we stopped playing with the board actually after that we were walking home and uh my girlfriend ended up getting possessed by whatever was following us from that night and i knew she was possessed because we were walking and all of a sudden she just completely stopped and she let go of my hand and she put her head down and I was like, you know, I looked at my friends and then I was like, what is she doing? You know? And so I asked, I was like, Hey, are you okay? What's wrong? And, uh, she didn't answer. So I, you know, asked a few more times and she didn't answer. And then finally I grabbed her arm and then I was like, what's wrong? And she lifted up her head and her eyes were completely red, like blood, crimson, red, no pupil, nothing, just completely really red and wow. in her voice her voice was like um i want to say like three voices in one as they say it you know and that wasn't her voice it was you know a dark like heavy you know graspy voice and uh she said don't fucking touch me and then she threw my arm down and then put her head down. And then I was like, I looked at my friends again. And I'm like, did you see that? And they're like, you know, they didn't know what to say either. And so then I tried again. I was like, you okay? And all of a sudden, she looked up and her eyes were normal. And she's like, where are we? You know, she's like, what are we doing? I was like, we're walking home. She's like, how are we here? She's like, last I knew, we were in, the, uh, in her room playing with the board. Wow. Yeah. That's so then, scary. <laughs> so that's one experience that we had. And then the main one I was going to talk about was probably, what was it, three years ago now, maybe? Be close to three years. Um, yeah. yeah. My wife, 
ran into one of our old friends and uh we're you know if you know us we're into you know halloween stuff and gothic mm -hmm. stuff and all that and uh so she ran into a friend and she was selling some of the stuff and uh she had a ouija board and it was you know a different one it didn't you know it wasn't the wooden looking one it was i don't know probably one that you could get at hot topic or something you know some kind of weird design like that and she thought it would be cool just to hang up in the house so she brought it home and uh after she brought it home like that night i was laying in bed and all of a sudden i heard my son's voice saying you know mom dad where are you and we knew you know we put him in bed and he was sleeping so i was like that's strange you know it's the middle of the night and then he's asking for us so i got up to check you know on him he was sleeping not making us sign or nothing and then so i went back to bed and then probably about you know 20 minutes later or so i heard his voice again and i was like what is you know what is he doing up again so i went and checked on him and he's still sleeping you know but that time when i went back out of his room i seen a black shadow dart from his room into the living room and i was like okay there's something here and well i'm kind of used to spirits because i'm a medium too but i could feel this is not you know ordinary just spirit i could tell it was a darker spirit mm. and then this is when i talked to you about it yeah and uh, from there, the next day, same thing. I heard, you know, my son's voice. And um, I was like, "That I know it's not him, you know. And uh, so we're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And then you said that you also felt um, like a male spirit in here that's not so bad or, you know, good. And then from there, he kind of let himself be known and you seen that there was this nasty spirit that was in here yeah. um, that was hiding and he was you know just messing with us and we both felt that you know things might get worse yeah we then figured out it came with the board so even though we didn't play with it or nothing, something was already attached to it from, you know, whoever played with it, that they came through. And so even if you don't play with something, you know, and you bring it into your house, you still can have troubles with it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I remember it took a little bit of effort to get rid of that entity out of your home and it did cause you physical harm. Yeah. Yeah. When we finally figured out where he was hiding, I tried to use, oh, I didn't have sage at the time, but I used incense. And he didn't want to get out of here. He was having fun, you know, tormenting us. Yeah, he was. So uh, while I was trying to get him out, yeah, he punched me in the face and in the chest. And uh, I even had, you know, red marks where I took pictures and showed you, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that was my, actually my first time, you know, being attacked by a spirit like that. And it's weird because, you don't think it's going to happen to you, you know, that something like that. I mean, I heard being scratched and stuff, but being hit like that, you know, mm -hmm. it felt like someone actually hit me. But eventually, you know, we did get rid of them. That was the last time I had anything to do with the board. You know, I don't even want one in the house now because you just never know. I saw the aftermath, the images of Nick after he'd been assaulted by the entity. He had very real, very nasty marks on his body where the entity had hit him. He sent me photos immediately after it had happened. He naturally was pretty shook up about it. Nick removed the board from his home after this experience, but before he did, he cleansed the board and closed the portal that had been left open, allowing the entity access to his home. 
He then destroyed the border and has had no further issues in his home. So you don't always have to physically use a board to allow access. If, as in his case, you purchase a second-hand one, you have no idea what it was used for beforehand, or if it was left open as this one was. In this episode, we've heard a number of experiences that people have had using or being around someone who is or has been using an Ouija board. Some seem pretty harmless, some are pretty scary. But the question is, are Ouija boards merely a game with very clever marketing? Or are they actually a door through which your worst nightmares could step? And if they are, then one would have to suppose that the ghost boxes and other forms of communication with the spirit world are actually the same, or rather could produce the same results. What do you all think? Let me know your thoughts. You can email me shadowlands at yahoo.com or flick me a message through the podcast website www.walkingtheshadowlands.com I want to thank all the members of my Walking the Shadowlands Facebook group who were kind enough to share their experiences with us. There were so many stories shared on the post I made asking members if they had any experiences that it was actually really hard to leave them out. So for those whose experiences didn't make this episode, it wasn't because they were not interesting, it was merely a matter of time constraints. And who knows, if there's enough interest in this episode, I may do another one with just experiences, and yours will be used in that episode. In the meantime, for those of you listening to this episode at night, sleep well. A bumper music today is called Are You Scared Yet? by Sasha End, licensed under Creative Commons. For more information, check out this episode's page on the podcast website at www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. If you have any suggestions for topics you might like me to cover in upcoming episodes, then please don't hesitate to contact me. Or if you have any questions, suggestions or any comments that you'd like to make or experiences that you might like to share with myself or my audience. Or if you think you might be a good fit as a guest for my podcast, then just email me at shadowlands at yahoo.com. Check out our Facebook page, Walk in the Shadowlands, our Instagram feed of the same name, and our Twitter feed, at Shadowlands10. Like and follow for hints on our upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a positive rating, and don't be shy to leave a written review on your chosen podcasting platform, or on the podcast Facebook page, Walk in the Shadowlands. Who knows? You may hear your review read out at the end of one of these podcasts. And of course, so you don't miss out on any episode, make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. This podcast is available on all free podcasting platforms and from iHeartRadio as well. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website www.walkingtheshadowlands.com For those hearing impaired, there's a full written transcript of each episode on the website. So you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show when you're back at work. Encourage them to listen and to subscribe also. The more the merrier. Thank you so much for listening today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. We'll see you in two weeks time. Thanks for listening. 